Welcome back, folks. We're here at the PDEC 2018 for another year of our Mining Snap segment. And I'm very, very happy to have with me Joe Mazumdar and Brent Cook, the Exploration Insights team. That's explorationinsights.com. And uh, yeah, thanks guys for being here. Glad to find you. Yeah, so before we get into the questions, you actually just, uh, you know, I was looking over your website. You recently redesigned it. Looks great. A lot of valuable free information. So I strongly encourage, go to explorationinsights.com and you see a lot of great information under their articles and media section. You get a lot of uh, their uh, presentations that they've done recently and just a lot of great information. And then obviously, you know, if you really want to make money and make some, uh, get some really good stock picks, subscribe, right? I think that's a good idea. Yeah, excellent. <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay, so basically, um, you know, today's topic, what I want to talk about is the abstract art of mining exploration, okay? Uh, you know, uh, what we've seen over the last two, three weeks now is, you know, we've seen a lot of the majors and the mid-tiers do a lot of the reserve resource estimates. And, uh, you know, on, on a conclusion, on an average basis, you're seeing that the reserves estimates, you know, didn't really change. A lot of them went down. Average grades were either the same or went down, except for maybe a couple of the majors where, you know, due to divestitures, mergers and acquisitions, or some brownfields exploration, they were able to increase the reserves or resource estimates. So mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on that uh, uh, for this year end, uh, 2017? What, what, what are your conclusions from the reserve estimates? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll start and, and leave it over to Joe, but in one of my, in my presentations, I showed a slide of both Barracks and Newmont's uh, reserves mm -hmm. uh, and production profile going forward. And basically, they're, they're declining steadily over the next 20 years. Um, and I think that's almost across the board in terms of mining companies. And it makes sense. I mean, we're mining 90 million ounces a year. We're finding, on average, 25 to 40 million ounces a year over the past 10 years. Right. Uh, so that's, that's, that's the real issue that the, the industry faces. And mm -hmm. I think in terms of uh, what we do, it's a real positive because we need to find ahead of them the real deposits, right. uh, real economic deposits. Right, right. Joe, any words? Well, I mean, in terms of like if we just stick to gold here, I mean, we've seen like gold price from, you know, the late 90s to about, uh, what is it, 2011, 2012 when it peaked, we've added like maybe 300, 400 million ounces of reserves. Right. But in the same time, we dropped the grade of the reserves by about half. Yeah. Uh, right. So what they're finding is now that the gold price has come down, to actually add reserves at at prices of 1,200 right. or 1,100, it's harder to do. Yeah. And so now we're seeing a flattening of the reserve grade because it's hard to add value. Right. So now. Right. What we're seeing going forward is flat production profiles, right. as Brent was talking about, yep. and basically the ability to just have a core of your asset profile that works mm -hmm. at these levels. Right. Because they're more right. about growing free cash flow right. than they are yeah. about growing reserves or volume right Interesting. now. Interesting. And, and to add on that, what, what gold price are they using for these reserve and resource estimates? Because now you're seeing, I've read some reports where they're using a different price based on the category on either whether it's a reserve or a resource, for oh, example. Th th that was always the case. That was always the case. You always oh, okay. use a higher That's price for the resource. Got you it. use a more lower price, conservative price for the reserve because okay. you don't want to take it out of reserve. Okay, you can avoid it. it. But what's interesting is some people are using, you know, uh, let's say $1,200 or 1100 reserves, but their business plan in terms of what they actually do is even lower. Interesting. Because they are worried that they might not make any money. Wow, yeah. okay. So that's a big problem in the industry going forward. And we'll touch on that, I guess. Yeah, I mean, later, because they've got to deal yeah. with big debt levels and they got right. to pay that back too. Right, right. So they have to generate free cash flow. Right. So what's the, you know, uh, you mentioned in, in our last interview last year, uh, you mentioned that the, you know, the majors are not doing a good job at exploration, not doing a good job overall in finding these new ounces. So what, uh, what you know, what, what is your, uh, what do you think? Are they still doing that right now going well, forward? Have they learned a lesson? Well, no, the reality is it, it flat out is getting harder to find economic deposits. Okay. I mean, consider for every 10 one gram deposits, there is one two and a half gram deposit, more or less. Right. All right. One gram might work at surface. It's not going to work at 300, 400, 500 meters where you're looking at because right. everything at the surface, most everything at the surface is found. Mm -hmm. So when they start drilling out these projects, right. they're going to find 10 uneconomic deposits for every one economic that they find. So mm -hmm. the odds are just going down. And add to that, it costs more money to explore these things at depth. Mm -hmm. And one drill hole doesn't kill it. One yeah. hill just, you know, you've got to actually evaluate these right. things. So it's going to get a lot harder to find it. And I don't see it getting any better. Nothing's going to make it better. Right. That's the new reality. So if it's harder to find it, what grade threshold are 
are you guys looking at? For example, when you are looking at companies where they might be takeout targets, what, well, what? it all depends. I mean, if you're looking for a, an open pit heap leachable deposit right. that's uh, like run of mine, you could go very low grade. You could go a half a gram or less. Mm -hmm. uh, but if it's going to be crushed, then suddenly you need like 0.9 to a gram. Right. And if you've got a millet, you need even higher grade. And wow. if it's refractory, even mm -hmm. higher grade. And then if it's underground, even higher grade. So. So saying that, hey, I've got a great high-grade deposit, and we look at it, and it's five grams in the middle of nowhere, mm -hmm. and it's selective mining, we say, that's not going to make any money yeah. because your cutoff should be five. Right, right. So everything, yeah. you know, that, that's the problem, is that you can't just look at the grade and say, wow, this is so much better than this. Mm -hmm. It's not. Yeah, yeah right. you got to look at it in terms of where it is, how, how do you have to extract it, how to metallurgically recover it. That sort of thing. Uh, all, all deposits aren't created equal. Interesting. Okay, so let's talk about now how the majors and mid-tiers are behaving in the future to kind of look for these new deposits. You know, you had a great presentation uh, earlier this year talking about active and passive exploration arrangements, right? So what is active and what is passive? So uh, what we've been seeing and uh, is uh, as opposed to exploration, some people are using their exploration budgets to actually invest in juniors as a proxy for their own lack of grassroots. Right. So some of these guys are what we, I, I was calling passive because they would put a 9.9 percent .9 placement in somebody and they might do five or ten companies but they but they're not really active technically and they're not really uh, like looking at the project as intently whereas some other people are more active not only will do they the private placement but they'll do a joint venture and earn in they'll put their team on it they'll put their stamp mm -hmm. on it and I guess a really good example for me is what happened with ATAC Resources when Agnico put their private placement in several years ago, and that was just a passive investment. You know, it bumped the stock originally, but really didn't do anything in terms right. of technical endorsement of the asset. Right. Because what they were looking for is Carlin type, big district scale stuff in the Yukon. But when Barrick came in, who actually mined Carlin type in the Carlin belt, for them to come in, put a technical stamp of approval on the project, that's helped ATAC a mm -hmm. lot. Interesting. So what makes a perfect passive or active exploration arrangement? I'll throw it to either of you. One where... Well, what are some, what are some of the key factors that make it, you know what, okay. I mean, basically, we're the, looking the, for the, the partner to buy out the junior at a real high stock price. That's, okay. That I would call a success. Okay, now, right, right. That's Absolutely. what we're after. <laughs> that's the so, but to get that, to be there, to get that to happen, you actually have to have a legitimate economic deposit. Right. And that's key. I mean... And I think you mentioned this statue today at your presentation that you you know all these companies are chasing all these uh, projects, these, these potentially discoveries and deposits, but a lot of them are just not going to be economic. It's just not possible, I think. Right? My experience has been that the majority of companies, even if they're successful in what right. they've got going on, their success isn't meaningful enough for the risk we're taking in buying these things. Right. Yeah. I mean, this is this is go big or go home sort of thing. Right. I, you know, if success to them is finding a small deposit that's going to mine 50,000 ounces a year or whatever, that's not really success for us. We okay. want, it's got to be big. Yeah. Okay. And and what's the proportion of passive and active exploration arrangements going forward? What have you re kind of recognized just visually, just look at the market? Well, the thing is that the, the passive tends to be, like if you measure it by uh, dollar amounts, the passive investment is less. But in terms of frequency, there's more passive than active. Okay. You know, but most of the guys that are spending the most money, the big money is in the active. Okay. Those are commitments of $50 million or more over a long term, like 10 years. Right. You know, um, staged, granted. Right. And I would say in terms of the junior perspective that we look at, you want staged, you want deliverables, you want some cash payments, yeah. you want the ability to dilute these guys down if they're not interested in the projects to be able to give it to somebody else. Mm -hmm. So from a junior perspective, as Brent was saying, if you got a good product, your ability to arrange a really good joint venture earning is much higher than if you've got a yeah. so-so product. Yeah. And the last, uh, last question to talk on this topic of brownfields and greenfields exploration. Where have you seen the majors and majors putting a lot of their proportion of their budgets over the last few years and going forward? Has it changed where they're now getting a little bit more, uh, putting more risk money on the table to put uh, expand their budgets on the exploration side of the greenfields? Or? Um, well, so I, I've done some graphics on uh, the proportion of exploration spent versus the sales revenue. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, like if you take Barrick, for example, like in the early years, there was up to 8% of their sales revenue spent on exploration. That's been declining. And now really GNA is almost the equivalent of exploration. Wow. Uh, it's between two to 4%. Uh, and that might be where we go going forward. Mm -hmm. uh, Barrick has had an uptake in 2017, but that decline in Barrick is the same for everybody, mm -hmm. whether I look at tech, whether I look at Newcrest, whether I look at whatever company. There's a, there's a secular trend decline in exploration. Interesting. And back from 2003, the amount of exploration dollars spent on grassroots has been declining since 2003. Wow. So if you talk about, oh, we had a down market in 2014 or what, the down market for grassroots exploration started a long time ago. Yeah, interesting. Okay, so Which let's actually, sorry, go ahead. Us, that brings us full, full circle back to where you started. Why it is why we're finding less deposits now than we than we used to, and right. why it's so much more difficult. And that's the other issue: is that the majors have not been putting money into grassroots exploration by and large. Right. And now they're they need to. Right, but it makes it probably uh, well. It leaves a lot of opportunity for you guys to look for those companies that are the targets, right? I mean, and, and I would just add that that's what makes us a bit more commodity agnostic. Ah, okay, right, yes, yes. So quality in any commodity. Right. And how that affects your level of investments. You know, you've seen that, you know, with the U.S. dollar has been strong the last few years, but it's been trending lower. U.S. equity market still performed very, very strongly until, you know, the last uh, few, uh, few weeks, actually, and most recently uh, with Trump's uh, import tariffs on steel and, uh, and uh, um, aluminium. What are your thoughts in terms of you know that? How does that affect your level of investment and, and, and the policies going forward there? That ignorant <laughs> I think is going to be positive for gold. I think what, what we're seeing here is um, as well, gold's holding up pretty well, right? Yeah. And I think it's because there's you know it's it's correlated with the with the U.S. dollar. Yeah. And as this Mueller investigation goes on, mm -hmm. the Russian mm -hmm. ties and connections and the financing of this like a private, you know, his family, if you will, yeah. I think those things are going to roll on. And you add to that the trade wars it's got going and all the other, you know, incomprehensible things that are going on in the U.S., that to me is going to be negative on the dollar. Mm -hmm. Despite possible interest rate rises, right? Yeah. Um, so that's what I see coming: is a, a stable to even improving gold price, based on that, as the world starts to back away from the U.S. dollar into other other areas. Perfect. Wow. Interesting. Okay. Well, then, uh, are there any last thoughts from both of you on the market overall, and what you guys are looking to accomplish here at the PDAC? I think we're reasonably positive. Okay, great. Is that right? Well, in terms of our thesis, yeah. we're absolutely positive. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Well, you know, thanks a lot, Joe and Brent. I really appreciate it. If you want to find out more information, go to explorationinsights.com. Again, uh, they just redesigned their website, very easy to navigate. They have a lot of great, valuable information, and subscribe to the newsletter, and I'm sure you do very, very well. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks. Thank All you right. very much. Cheers.